The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Han, Lauren McCullough Robertson speaking. Also with me, we've got Melanie Simmons and Tegan Middleton. Thank you very much for um, joining the webinar, and my apologies that um, I delayed the webinar for a week. I was on roll last week. I've been able to hear it very much if I did, um, if we did run the webinar. So thank you for your patience and for signing up uh, once again. Today we're speaking about recent amendments that um, commenced uh, changes to the Environmental Protection Act. These changes have implications for local government um, in two respects, um, and we want to talk about both of them today. Um, before I get started, though, there is a function, for those of you who haven't attended one of our webinars in the past, there's a function on your screen, or there should be, to um, type a question to us. And we very much welcome questions throughout the discussion, uh, and we will get to them uh, as soon as they pop up, or if there's an appropriate time, we'll, we'll come back to them um, later on in the, in the discussion. So please make use of that function. If anything comes to mind, then um, shoot through a question. Uh, we're, we're sitting around you like a little space station with laptops in front of all of us and we'll see the question pop up and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So the amendments to the Act were made um, under a bill passed on 21 April 2016, all pretty new and all um, pretty unique to Queensland. The chain of responsibility concept is one which you guys might have come across in other fields, but certainly in in uh, relation to environmental protection, this is uh, a new and unique approach. One triggered, as you all know, by um, some specific circumstances arising in Queensland, um, where the government thought that the individual behind um, some projects, which uh, the government thought was, weren't being remediated as they should be, should foot the bill for the remediation. That individual may or may not be caught by the changes that they have been introduced. Uh, whether that's the case will be very interesting to watch. I'm sure it'll be a long um, debate through the courts. However, others are caught. Uh, the legislation has been drafted very broadly to enable the department or the administering authority, depending on the nature of the ERA that we're talking about, to chase the money, really, to follow um, particularly with respect to a project experiencing financial difficulties, but not only in that respect, to follow the, um, the money, follow the financial benefits, follow the individuals and entities in a position to influence the company's compliance. And to chase those entities down um, to pay for remediation, to pay for cleanup costs, and um, really, for the department, it puts the department in the position to carry out those activities and basically issue a bill to those entities. How does this affect council? Well, it affects council as a potential related person. The definition of related person is drafted very broadly, and there are instances that we'll talk about where council may find itself as a related person, um, where, for example, um, a contractor or another entity is experiencing financial difficulties and council draws a, a financial benefit from the project, it may be that council technically fits the bill. It may also be, though, that council is at its wit's end in regulating a site and um, where, for example, a company uh, is unable uh, or not in a financial position to pay for a mediation and all of council's ordinary um, uh, enforcement tools are exhausted, it may be that it's, this is a mechanism that council itself needs to um, implement. We want to talk about that and we want to talk about the um, checks and balances that we think council should ensure are in place before um, uh, making use of this new power. <laughs> so that's really the scope of the discussion today. Um, and we'll sort of step through each of those concepts. As I say, if anything I've just said by way of introduction triggers a question, please shoot it through now. Uh, we'll make sure that we answer that question through the course of the discussion or jump straight to it now, just depending on, um, 
on what the question is. Um, as the amendments came through pretty quickly, these, the, the concerns around Clive Palmer's sites and the concerns around the mechanisms that he and his organisation might put into place in order to avoid potential costs um, prompted the department to move very quickly in drafting and implementing the legislation. The, um, this momentum was only um, strengthened when uh, Link Energy uh, when it's voluntary administration partway through the parliamentary debate around the bill. Uh, that was seen by you know, both sides of parliament to be something that really reinforced the need to move quickly in, um, in implementing these amendments. And so what that meant for stakeholders um, was that we were consulted, but the time frames and the consideration of the responses uh, were pretty rushed and that's something that is, is acknowledged by Parliament and acknowledged by the relevant ministers openly that it was the legislation was rushed and as a result of that I think we see that there's an inbuilt mechanism to review the legislation in two years time uh, to see if it's capturing the right capturing the big fish and not not the little ones um, and so in two years time we'll see a review uh, and that is really an acknowledgement, I reckon, of the, how quickly this legislation came into being. Uh, the Agriculture and Environment Committee um, was commissioned to prepare a report on the bill and did um, attract um, submissions from stakeholders throughout our industry. We've had a look at some of the key submissions and certainly at the um, committee's report on the bill. Um, a number of the committee's recommendations um, gave rise to some level of amendment to the act as it was passed, and we'll talk about that. Um, some of them uh, were not didn't, didn't really um, gather much traction, and uh, as, it, as it turned out, the committee was unable to agree on whether the bill should be passed, even should all these amendments, all these recommendations, I'm sorry, be adopted. Um, so the thrust of the new legislation is that the administering authority may issue an environmental protection order to a related person of an environmental authority holder. That is uh, an environmental protection order um, that may trigger ongoing operational expenses to improve the environmental performance at a particular site, an environmental protection order to clean up a specific issue or an environmental protection order to give effect to final rehabilitation at a site. That's what the that's the thrust of the legislation is to capture environmental authority holders not operating to a standard that the administering authority is satisfied with. In many cases the administering authority would be DEHP. In some cases, with respect to default powers, it, it will be council. So a Related person, the concept of related person is really central to these amendments because the power is to issue an order on a related person. A related person being a holding company of the EA holder, the owner of the land uh, on which the activities are carried out. Now there's a carve out for resources companies there and I'll speak about that in just a sec. Um, that carve out is that the owner of the land must also be an associated entity with the resources company. A person that the administering authority determines has a relevant connection with the company. A relevant connection is a very broadly defined term and we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, now, the, the land ownership issue is one that was raised by many submitters um, uh, who made submissions to the Agriculture and Environment Committee. Uh, it, the particularly resources companies, the Queensland Resources Council, and other submitted, such as I think Appia, the big body in the petroleum industry, made submissions to the effect that by um, exposing the owner of land underlying resources activities to the rehabilitation costs of those activities, it becomes near impossible then for the resources company to strike a deal with the landowner to allow the activities to proceed. The landowner obviously being in a position where unknown whether the exposure might extend all the way through to rehabilitation. Those submissions were heard by both the 
Committee, the Agricultural and Environment Committee, and also Parliament. And I think um, the Shadow Minister um, proposed amendments on the floor, and those amendments were accepted to carve out um, landowners underlying a resource activity unless the landowner is an associated entity. So where, for example, Glencore is widely known to own a whole lot of the land um, under a different company name, and a whole lot of the land underlying its project under a different company name, well, that would certainly be um, an associated entity of the EA holder, and that entity would be captured. But otherwise, in the resources space, the landowner is, it has been given a um, get-out-of-jail-free card. Not so, though, for other industries, and that's um, of critical importance to council. Landowners are still caught by some activities, and we'll, we'll run through that in a bit more detail. If you have any questions in that regard, please shoot them through. As I said a moment ago, the administering authority may determine that an entity holds a relevant connection with the EA holder. And, and if an entity is determined to hold a relevant connection, that entity may be the subject of an environmental protection order. This is an incredibly broad category. The, really, the, the definition of relevant connection is something that um, it is intentionally and unashamedly designed to allow the administering authority to track down the entity that it thinks should pay for rehabilitation and go after them for it. That's the whole intent and purpose of the bill. Um, now, the bill as originally proposed um, didn't include any kind of um, minimum threshold on the concept of benefiting financially. So the bill as originally contemplated included within the scope of a relevant connection someone who benefited financially from the company's activities. And that was seen by all submitters, by many, many submitters to be uh, way too broad. And as passed, the Act allows the, the administering authority to determine that any entity that takes a significant financial benefit from the activity has a relevant connection with the EA holder. Again, that, that is still a really broad um, concept. Uh, significant financial benefit is an undefined term. And um, the department, um, in, in drawing a consideration, the question is, how on earth can the administering authority know what the significant financial benefit is? What test is going to be based on that, how do we draw the connection, how do we draw a relevant connection between two entities on the basis of this concept of a significant financial benefit? And that is something that I think gives rise to a bit too much uncertainty. And I say that both from the perspective of the administering authority and, of course, from the entities who may or may not take a significant financial benefit from activities. Um, as a result of the submission made through the Agricultural Environment Committee, there were some specific carve-outs. Um, these amendments, again, were proposed on the floor and accepted by both sides of Parliament. Um, it is irrelevant if the person is capable of or has significantly benefited financially under a native title or cultural heritage agreement, a compensation agreement, for example, with a landowner, or a make good agreement, um, uh, basically a uh, groundwater make good agreement that resources companies have been entering into in many of the basins around Queensland. Um, now that, so those um, entities can feel comfortable that they won't be caught, but otherwise we're given no guidance as to what a significant um, financial benefit may be. There are some relevant factors that the admission authority may, and I highlight may, take into account when determining whether or not an entity has a relevant connection. Um, the extent of the person's control of or financial interest in the operator, uh, whether the person is an executive officer of the operator or a holding company, so a director, for example, the extent to which a leg legally recognisable structure or arrangement makes it possible for the person to receive a financial benefit from the operator. To me, that is um, almost as broad as if the consideration 
wasn't included in the Act because it doesn't give us any real certainty what is a legally recognisable arrangement that makes it possible for a person to receive a financial benefit. Again, I really think there's a, there's a little bit too much uncertainty around some of these um, concepts. Um, and you know, the, the next bullet point only adds that any agreement or transaction the person enters into with the operator or its holding company. Um, the extent to which dealings between the person and the operator are arm's length, independent, and on a commercial footing, uh, or for the person providing professional advice. So there are some areas of comfort, I suppose, that uh, entities can take away from these um, factors. However, as I said right at the start, they are um, uh, factors that may be taken into account. Uh, what we really need, and uh, as I'll come to a bit later on, what is currently being um, prepared as some um, some guidelines around the manner in which administering authorities should implement the uh, and should have regard to these considerations. Now, something that um, I haven't mentioned is that, and I'll just flip forward just give me for one second. So, sorry about that. Um, I just think I might have accidentally deleted the slide. Uh, uh, another um, entity which may be captured uh, is an entity that um, is in a position of influence. So if, if an entity is in a position to influence the compliance, the environmental compliance of the EA holder, then that entity may also um, be, be issued an environmental protection order. And that's something with a little bit of extra retrospectivity to it as well. So if you've been in a position to influence compliance any time in the past two years, then you are um, potentially for an environmental protection order for cleanup costs or remediation costs or rehabilitation costs. And that's something that really does exercise our mind because um, it might be that you feel like you've walked away, and I'm, I'm putting myself in the shoes, for example, of an operator who has sold a site to another operator. And the new operator comes in as a bit of a rogue operator looking to cut corners and, and maybe isn't as financially viable as the previous operator. If that new operator comes in, as I said, cuts some corners and potentially, for example, suffers financial difficulty, then the previous operator within the past two years is someone who may well be on the hook for those remediation costs or an EPO under this, these new laws. And again, that kind of uncertainty around um, liability allocation and the, the um, ability to deal with liability through transaction documents is something that administering authorities just need to be careful about um, in the manner in which these new laws are implemented. And it is um, something that I think the guidelines need, need to address. Also, for council, it's something that where you are divesting yourself of a site where you think you are, and you've been operating the site as a model citizen um, and in compliance with all of your environmental controls. If you divide, divest the, the site, you may need to be really careful in the transaction documents and in your due diligence of your buyer to make sure that you, you don't foresee within the next couple of years potential exposure cropping up for rehabilitation and other costs. And that's something that um, uh, permeates all industries, um, any, basically any site that requires an environmental authority uh, for it to be operated. Now, moving on then to um, what, what you should do and what needed to be done. There, another amendment that was pushed through on the floor um, during parliamentary debate was that one of the um, factors that the admission authority may uh, take into account when determining whether or not to issue an EPO to a related person is whether the related person took all the reasonable steps to ensure that the operator complied and to ensure that the operator made an adequate provision to fund rehab and restoration. 
this is something that is not unfamiliar to us. It's framed in a slightly different way, but it's the same kind of, sorry, executive officers currently hold it, um, currently carry liability for their company um, or council's um, offences under the Act, except that they have available to them a defence, and the defence being that they can demonstrate that all reasonable steps were taken to ensure compliance. So this concept is not brand spanking new. It's in a slightly different context, but it's one that we think council needs to um, uh, really clearly understand. To do that, we need we all need to keep an eye out for the guidelines when they do come through, and we need to understand what all reasonable steps means um, in the context of your own operation. Um, if you're looking to protect council from potential liability, then you need to be able now to demonstrate, sorry, I should say, um, I don't reckon we're going to see any local authorities on the hook for an EPO under these new laws anytime soon. Um, local governments are not the target. Uh, indeed, I think road operators are the target, and I think um, you know entities that are trying to escape from and get all, get out of their rehabilitation obligations are the target. However, local council does deal with entities which may or may not fall into that category. And if the entity is successful through some liquidation or voluntary administration or some other um, strategy is successful in escaping um, liability, it may be that the administering authority casts around for another entity, including potentially local government, to um, for someone to, to pay these costs. And that's kind of the worst case scenario, not one that I think is likely, in fact one that I think is very unlikely. But in any event, in order to ensure your council is up to date, your liability is managed in the best way it possibly can be, and that your executive officer's liabilities are as well. What we're saying is, I reckon you need to look at this all reasonable steps um, uh, consideration and then look at your policies and your implementation of them. When you're looking at um, contractor sites or sites that you take a significant financial benefit from but don't have direct control over, um, and make sure that you do, your council does have documentation in place, does take steps, for example, to order the um, company, the, the operators, compliance with environmental controls and imposes the council's own high standards of performance environmentally on the operator of those sites. Now, this may be something that your council already does. Um, certainly, some councils probably already do, and particularly with reference to some particularly high profile sites. But it may also be something that isn't uniformly implemented across the board and that some kind of risk um, management uh, and liability management is needed to make sure that you're able to demonstrate to the administering authority, should an investigation come about, that all reasonable steps were in fact taken by council with respect to those sites. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we wanted to gather everybody together to discuss this new law, because um, we don't think that you'll be directly on the hook. We think it's, it's, it's unlikely that that will occur. We also think that you can manage that risk down even further by um, making sure that your policies are implemented and some sort of risk uh, assessment is carried out with respect to sites that you take a benefit from or are in a position to influence the compliance of but don't have direct control over. Um, interestingly, the um, the requirement that you that, that the related person ensured that there was adequate provision to fund rehabilitation and restoration is an additional requirement, right? So in addition to taking all reasonable steps to ensure compliance, you now need to start on picking the, the books of the um, entities that do operate these, these high-risk sites and make sure that there is an adequate provision for rehabilitation. Um, again, you know, this, this gives rise to contractual and procurement considerations when, you talk, when you're dealing with uh, potential high-risk sites. Um, and 
it, it, it's a new concept. It's one that you wouldn't have ordinarily needed to uh, look into the, the provision, the financial provision to fund rehab and remediation. It's not something that you otherwise might have made inquiries about on engaging somebody to operate um, one of your high risk sites. Now our recommendation is that you kind of have to. And if you've already got someone out there doing it, then it might be time to ask some questions. Um, as I said earlier, an another um, group of entities caught by all this are owners of land. Um, so owners of land on which environmentally relevant activities are carried out under, under an EA now may, and I would suggest as an absolute last resort, uh, be entities that are captured by the, um, the power to issue an EPO. Uh, this has far-reaching consequences. I've already discussed the, um, the reaction of the resources industry to, to this through stakeholder um, consultation, but more broadly than that as well, there were um, submissions made, for example, by the Queensland Law Society that um, these provisions basically mean that entities with no influence or control over operations and no connection or fi financial interest in the operations uh, may now be captured for rehabilitation costs. Despite um, considerations and many submissions to that effect, and the committee's recommendation to admit landowners entirely as a category of related persons. The bill has passed, and I've, I've mentioned this earlier, includes landowners um, in, it, in industries other than uh, resources activities. Jumping then to a couple of examples, um, we just wanted to, I guess, bring this home for council. Council may um, own or draw the financial benefit from the management of a large waste facility. Um, it may be that as a result of its connection with the activities at site and as a result of the breadth of the definition of related person under these new changes, that council is at law a related person. Um, where the operator failed to comply then with the EA and I would suggest where the administering authority has chased that operator for remediation and has been unable to um, secure it through the normal enforcement tools. It may be that um, council or some other related person, for example the holding company of the operator or both, are on the hook for an EPO. Now this is a Obviously, this is expressed as a stern warning and it's really more of a hypothetical um, as a result of the manner in which the law has been drafted. But it, it is something that we think you need to be aware of and that's kind of why we're saying in these sorts of instances, and, and quarries might be another example as well where you know, perhaps you own the land underneath a quarry, um, we, we just suggest that the reasonable steps be taken um, uh, to ensure compliance. In these instances, as I said earlier, it may be that the administering authority is chasing the primary company, the holding company, another related person, the owner of the land, which who knows who that may be, council or someone else, uh, and a significant financial beneficiary, you know, that may be council. It may be that the EPO is chasing all of these people trying to find somebody who can pay for the cleanup costs. In that instance, the admission authority may issue an EPO to all of them. And they all may be jointly and severally liable for those cleanup costs. And if the EPO is, um, if the requirements of the EPO are not met by any of those entities, council, I'm oh, sorry, the admission authority may step in, um, carry out the cleanup, and then issue a bill. A critical element to all of this um, is how will the, how should the admission authorities 
um, implement this law. Uh, the and the Act has passed, um, and again this is one of those amendments that we debated on the floor. The Act has passed includes a requirement that um, that the Admission Authority consider any relevant statutory guidelines when deciding whether or not there is a relevant connection and whether or not to issue an EPO. Uh, those guidelines are not yet out, but they're being um, developed uh, in consultation with relevant stakeholders now. Uh, one of the key messages there, of course, you know, council is an environmental regulator and needs to be involved, to the extent you're not already, needs to be involved in the um, development of those guidelines. That's one point. Another point, and now I'm turning to the second um, um, element of the discussion being council as the regulator. And so please shoot through any questions that you might have about that first part. But council as a regulator needs to feed, in my view, feed into the development of these statutory guidelines. And also, um, uh, have its own policies in place, ensure that it has policies in place as to when this new power should and shouldn't be activated. I think that this power is very broad. It's something that needs to be carefully weighed up against all the other enforcement tools already available to council. So we're talking about um, an instance where you've tried everything else. Um, and failing all other attempts, it might be time to cast around for somebody that is a related person to the uh, entity that held or holds the relevant environmental authority. It would be uh, prudent, I think, for council to be informed by the to inform the development of the statutory guidelines and be informed by the statutory guidelines in developing its own internal policies on how this fits within its enforcement framework. Uh, that first point on the next slide, I think, is what I was just trying to say a moment ago, that the new, new powers are probably most relevant to problem sites, legacy issues. You've been, you're at your wit's end, you've been trying and trying and trying to, um, to get this site remediated. All else has failed and now it's time to cast around for a related person. If so, this is a new power, something you need to be aware of. Your enforcement guys need to be aware of the power to issue an EPO and who the new um, recipients of an EPO may be. And you may already have, you, this power exists today. There's no statutory guideline in place, but the power exists today. So you may already have sites that it would be appropriate to issue an EPO um, to a related person. My strong suggestion would be that it's something you consider very carefully before you do it. Um, but it's something that is open to you. And for all I know, you know, there, there are already sites out there where this would be an appropriate measure for you to take. So these next, that next slide really um, just deals with some of the comments that I've just, I've just made. Slides can be made available to you guys later as well for your reference. We can shoot them around by email. Um, now the Act has another couple of elements to it, um, and some of them are on the slide right now. Um, also elements related to the transfer of environmental authorities and financial assurances, some retrospectivity issues and, and other things that are um, dealt with in detail on the slides. I thought I might pause there um, and uh, call for any questions you might have, um, any other points that, um, that you guys wanted to make. Um, so it's difficult, I suppose, by way of webinar to make this interactive, but um, uh, shoot through any questions you, you, you've got at the moment on screen and we'll get straight back to you. And um, yeah, I'm just going to push in. It's Melanie here. Um, I just wanted to follow on from Tim's earlier point about this fitting in within the framework, um, the existing enforcement framework. 
um, when council is looking as an administering authority um, to enforce compliance with conditions of the environmental authority for one of the ERAs that's devolved to council. Um, Obviously, your, your enforcement strategy is always going to depend on the circumstances. Um, but EPOs, the ability to stretch those to other potential parties is just one thing to look at. If you are looking at commencement of civil or criminal proceedings against someone who's non-compliant with conditions of an environmental authority, often you would be proceeding against the owner of the land as well as the operator in any case. Um, so those sorts of land ownership issues, you know, might fall out in the wash in that respect. Um, if you're looking at EPOs to try and get some, some actions to be undertaken um, without the need to go to court um, and you want to go beyond the particular corporate entity that you're looking at who's operating the site, Obviously, there's some detailed investigations that you need to do to pierce that corporate veil. Um, so those sorts of things would all need to be considered and it might be that council very rarely would rely on these additional liability provisions. Um, sorry, I'm just getting a note here. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was just, <laughs> um, I was just um, making a note to Melanie that there might be circumstances where the EA holder is no longer in existence where a corporate entity is wound up or runs away or disappears in a puff of smoke. And in those instances, these new powers would enable enforcement against the parent company, enforcement against other entities with a relevant connection. So that's, that's where the shoe is on the other foot and council can make inquiries as to where the relevant connection might lie and try to find the entity that sat behind the EA holder uh, if the corporate machinations allowed the EA holder to, to disappear in a puff of smoke. And so that, that would be another instance where it might be that, that this new power becomes um, something that council wants to consider. Um, one question we've got is uh, what about officers who no longer work for council? Um, there are two layers, I think, in answer to that question. The first one is that I think that officers, council officers, are in all likelihood um, never going to receive an enforcement action against them under this new law. Can't say that for sure, but I'd be very, very surprised if that was the case. Um, however, there is a level of retrospectivity to it. So to broaden the question out a little bit, if an entity was in a position to influence a company's compliance in the past two years, then, then that entity is susceptible to an environmental protection order under the amendments. Uh, and so should um, a relevant connection be determined and somebody has moved on in their employment, but at the time that they were with um, the relevant entity, they held that position of influence, then that would not stop that their change in role would not stop the department or the admission authority from chasing that individual down. Um, but as I say, it's more the client partners of the world that uh, this is targeted at uh, rather than any particular council officer. That's right. If I can just add in there while Tim's looking at the other questions that have come in. Um, if you're not a client partner and you don't have those financial uh, backings, it's unlikely that as a council officer you would be chased under this legislation because you just simply won't have the money for them to come after and this legislation is primarily aimed at being able to follow the money. That's right and look, with all of that said, the executive officers of council need to be aware of the executive officer liability provisions within the Environmental Protection Act as they stood before these amendments. Um, nothing in these amendments water those down at all, so um, executive officers are still exposed in circumstances where council has committed an offence under the Act, um, but we don't think that these new changes expose individuals within council any more than they um, previously were exposed. Um, we've got a question as to who within council should be briefed on the amendments. I think that your enforcement team would probably already be aware of them. But one thing that 
I would encourage you to, to uh, double check is that um, someone in council is involved in and is feeding information to the, the development of the statutory guidelines as to how the enforcement of these provisions um, should be implemented by administering authorities. I think that's a really key step for councils to be taking right now while the statutory guidelines are being um, developed. Um, and, and absolutely the other team who probably need to be made uh, very aware of this uh, is your procurement team. So particularly where services, for example, are being procured to operate a high-risk site, um, and indeed where services have already been procured and uh, are being performed by a third party at a high-risk site, um, I think that council would be well served to consider its own potential for future liability under the terms on which those um, those entities are engaged. So I think talk to your procurement guys, ask them about the, um, the high-risk sites that are out there and who operates them, ask them what steps are taken to ensure environmental compliance. Do you know what the controls are? Have you seen the relevant environmental authority conditions and have you seen the uh, environmental standards to which these third parties operate? Uh, do you carry out any level of audit? Do you have someone on site once a week? Is there any, what steps are taken by council to ensure these third parties comply with their environmental control? I think that that's, your, your procurement team um, is, is, is key on because they will understand who is engaged and what their what their services are and what your processes are moving towards a new engagement and both of those two um, areas trigger some level of investigation. But equally, I suppose moving on then to your environmental teams, do you have people who go out and, and carry out independent audits? Maybe not. But do you at least receive a copy of audits that are carried out at, at your high-risk sites? Do you follow up when there are red flagged items? And what is your follow-up procedure? What's your documentation around it? So that it's, it's, there's a lot of uh, a lot to consider in all of that. But um, I think it's, it's absolutely critical that council um, consider who it is engaging to provide these services and how it engages them to do so and what level of oversight it, it, it includes. Oh, we, have, we have another question. So the question, um, will any prosecution against a person be of a criminal or civil nature? Very good question. Um, in the first instance, the enforcement tool would be receipt of uh, an environmental protection order. The environmental protection order is um, a, it is a statutory requirement to comply with the terms of an environmental protection order. Failure to comply is an offence. Willful failure to comply is a criminal offence. And so, in the first instance, the enforcement tool would be um, a stat the imposition of a new statutory requirement and that, that being to comply with the EPO. Failure to comply though triggers potential criminal or civil proceedings. And the other, in practice, the other step that would be taken against the recipient of an EPO that fails to comply is that the admissioning authority would potentially step in, depending on how expensive the work is we're talking about, the admissioning authority may step in, carry out the work itself and then um, be able to recover the cost of doing so. Uh, oh, my apologies, Stephen, did you want to...? Sorry, I was just um, aiming to clarify that... Correcting, um, correcting me. Uh, as you know, uh, Council in its, in its role as administering authority can't issue clean-up notices, but uh, DEHP will be able to if they are acting as the administering authority under the Act. Right. And obviously, the, um, sorry, it's Melanie here. <laughs> uh, obviously, if you're dealing with an, is an issue of non-compliance with an EPO, the decision which way to go in terms of a criminal or a civil proceedings, if you want to enforce the EPO, um, depends on the circumstances. Um, and there's a range of issues to be considered if you're going down the path of criminal proceedings in terms of evidence and the higher, higher um, standard of proof required. 
Um, so either of those options is still on the table if you um, have non-compliance with an environmental protection order. I think that, um, thanks Melanie and Tegan, I think that that um, answers all of the questions that we've received so far. As I say, the slides will be distributed um, and feel free to, if you have any further thoughts, feel free to shoot them through by way of email. Um, our time is pretty well up anyway, so we might um, we might call it there unless there are any final questions. Otherwise, thank you all very much for attending, and um, if you have any further queries, then please um, give us a shout.